So let's jump into it. Today we're going to focus on getting ready for the project and making the right selection. So we'll first start about aligning on what your goals are for the project. What are you trying to achieve here and, um, and making sure that everyone's on board with it because it is a challenging process. It will get challenging throughout the implementation. So the better you align up front, the better uh, success you're going to have overall. We'll talk a little bit about your strategy going into the implementation. Then we'll talk about just some things you really should take the time to do before you get too far down the path with the implementation. So it, there are definitely things you can do that will save you pain and anguish later on in the implementation. So let's take it, let's talk about what those things are going into it. And then I'm going to walk you through the process of buying software, of what are the steps to buy a Microsoft Dynamics 365 business application who's all involved, what ex steps should you expect to see as part of the process as well too, so how you can be an informed buyer as you go through that process. All right, so let's jump in. Uh, I'm, throughout the, these webinars, I'll be talking a little bit, uh, or talking about the Stone Ridge Proven Process. So the Stone Ridge Proven Process is what we use to do implementations, and it follows this process starting with Align, where you align on your strategy, you align on your approach, you align on whether or not this is the right partner for you. Then the next step in the process is to really define what's going to happen uh, and get into the details. Once you've got that alignment, now what exactly is going to happen? Make sure everyone's on board with that. The next step in the process is to create the solution. So configure the solution, build the customizations, um, and uh, you know, migrate the data, all the things that you need to do to be able to have a working system. Then the next step in the journey is to deploy the solution. So training, hypercare, getting ready for go live, doing the actual go live activity. And then the final step is empower. So th that's first getting through the hypercare and making sure that you've got the solution in a stable place, but then it's building on top of this investment. So you made a big investment to get this solution into place, how can you take greater advantage of it? So that's really what we talk about in the empower phase. <coughs> Excuse me. So today we're gonna focus primarily on the align phase <coughs> with a little bit of discussion about the discover and demo portion of the define phase as well too. All right, so let's, uh, and then each of these following webinars will be primarily focused on one of the phases in the uh, proven process. So next time we'll be defined, then we'll do create, deploy, empower, for example. All right, so you're about to go on a digital road trip. You're about to take your business to a new place with a better solution to help support what you wanna do as a business. So. As you go on this digital road trip, you got to make sure that you're, you know, packed and ready for this adventure. So first off, you know, where do you want to go? Uh, what is that grand vision for where you want, what you want your system to be? Now these are really foundational systems that provide you with great amount of capability, but also serve as a bit of a platform for how you want to extend the solution. So again, you could extend the solution through. Power Apps or Power Platform, Power BI, you can also extend the solution by integrating it to other uh, solutions that you might be working with. So it's great to have an overall view of where do you eventually want to end up with all of this and then figure out from there how does it make sense to, to break those into you know, pieces that you can successfully bite off and chew. So that's really the part about what are the stops along the way. So what does step one look like? What does step two look like? How do you go ahead and get to this kind of digital uh, division? And one of the great things about cloud software now is that you don't have to stop and like do another major upgrade five years in the future. So in a lot of cases in the past with talking about on-premise software, you do a project and then you almost feel like you have to redo that project five years from now that's no longer the case. You can continue to build on this solution that requires updates, but not upgrades. So it does really allow you to be able to get towards that long-term vision that, uh, that you wanna achieve as a business. 
So I, the first step that I recommend to everybody is really define the vision statement for the project. So what is your overall vision? Where do you want to be? Where do you want to end up um, in the end? And make sure that you've got everybody aligned and excited about where you're going to go. So this is going to be you know, a long-term road trip, right? This is not driving from uh, you know, Madison, Wisconsin to Chicago. This is, you know, going from Maine to Maine to San Diego here. So you're going to be on a bit of a journey and make sure that you feel comfortable with the uh, steps that you have along the way and that you're going to be able to get to your destination. So leadership alignment is probably one of the most important things in projects and where I've seen lots of challenges in projects in the past as well, too. So these are some questions that I want you to ask um, as you're working to define what your project looks like. So first off, does this project help us achieve our one and five year goals? There are times when you do an implementation process where it's really just a technology, like our technology is old and terrible. We wanna to get to decent technology. I mean, there's, there's a lot more that the system can do than just you know, improve your technology uh, platform, but that could be one of the key things. If you're dealing with ransomware and have lots of risks with, uh, you've got older folks retiring who know how to manage your AS400 system, all of those things might be really critical to the future. And you might say, we just need an upgraded platform because of the risks associated with our current platform. But ideally you wanna look at going, do we wanna expand our number of sales through e-commerce? Do we want to create, you know, we want to have less warehouses in the future that are more efficient? Do we want to make sure that all of our field sales folks have mobile phones that tell them exactly where to go at, at a given time, exactly what the work order is, and, and that will save us considerable cost, or we can do more projects with less folks based on the efficiencies that we've gained in the business. So think about those efficiencies, how do those map out and, and coincide with what your long-term goals are. Another question is, you know, is this project worth the time and money? So really think hard about how this project is going to save you money overall, uh, create efficiencies, create additional revenue streams, all of those things. Because if you don't think about that and then you get into a project and there's a request for another 50 grand or something like that, you could end up um, saying, well, it's it's not worth it overall if you haven't realized what the value overall would be in this project. So get everybody excited about where this project is going to make a significant difference for your bottom line in the end. Another question is, are you willing to commit the time and the team's time to make this successful? So again, these these are challenging projects. And you've got to be willing to commit your time as a leader, as well as your team's time to be able to make this project successful. If you don't do that, it's not going to be successful. You know, the best implementers um, are not put in a very good position if they have to guess what the business does and guess what the business might want. I mean, you're not going to be happy with the results if you just leave them to kind of guess uh, and, and figure it all out on their own. Uh, another key question is, are you able to lead your team through change? So anytime you're implementing a new business application software, it's a significant amount of change to your daily processes. So are you willing and able to lead your team through that change? Um, it, again, you're going to get challenged by the folks who are like, well, I've always done it this way. I want to keep doing it this way. You're going to have to have an argument for why the new way is better and you're going to have to deal with those difficult conversations and you're going to have to paint this picture for the vision of where you're going in the business and so you've got to be willing to lead your team through that change and then another key question is are you going to be committed when the going gets tough because the tough will uh, the project will get tough i'll talk about in in a couple webinars about kind of the pit of despair that typically happens on any kind of project and uh are you going to stay committed to it through that challenging period? Are you going to work through it? Are you going to figure it out? Are you going to you know, get your team re-excited about it? Are you going to make the commitment that you might need financially to keep that project moving forward and achieving those results that you want in the end? 
So that leadership alignment is uh, is really key to success on the project. Teams where you have really good leadership alignment and leadership involvement, those are the projects that go well. So next you want to define your success metrics. So what does success look like? It should be, these should be measurable metrics. So everybody, when we talk to clients about this, they're like, well, I want it to be on time on budget. Well, that is good, and that should be something that you want in an implementation. But you know, ultimately, what, is, what does success look like in terms of how does this help your business? So here's like an example of some potential success criteria. So, you know, I want to reduce some manual labor. I want to create efficiency in my purchase order requisitions. I want to have a leadership scorecard so I can make better decisions. I want to be able to analyze leads and opportunities and improve my close rate because I know we can stay out of deals that we typically lose and do more deals that we typically win. I want to you know, save money on on-premise solutions with big annual maintenance fees and IT staffing components. Or I want to improve team member retention by just creating a more frustration-free experience with systems. So again, don't discount that last one as a potential option too. Uh, especially as younger folks get into the market, uh, they are very interested in digital solutions and can get really frustrated by a paper-based process too. So if you want to be able to attract folks in their 20s, you're going to want to have a solution that is easy and as simple as you know using their phone is to them too. So think about that aspect of it as well. And then make sure that these success metrics are aligned with your overall organizational goals. So from an ownership level all the way down to uh, an employee level. And then ultimately you want them to be achievable, right? I mean, if you're talking about a 20% improvement in efficiency of purchase order requisition, you're not necessarily gonna have that on day one after you go live, but you wanna do a checkpoint a year or 18 months in to see like, are you starting to realize this? But you want these goals to be goals to be realistic, and then you want to celebrate when you have achieved these as well too. So um, again, these are challenging projects, and anytime you can celebrate success as you go through the project, you should take the time to do that. All right, now let's talk about this kind of approach that you want to take to a project. So again, what um, what software overall is going to fit our needs? So what should you be thinking about from that standpoint? Um, you know, when do you want this done? Are there any timelines that you need to be thinking about and respecting? Uh, you know, we do a lot of work in the agriculture space. And so the spring and the fall are very busy times. That's probably not, you know, the middle of the fall is probably not a good time to go live with a commodity or grain solution. So you wanna think about what makes most sense from a timing standpoint. Can we phase the project in? So are there things that you can do in steps that will eventually get you to where you wanna go, but then it breaks it down into smaller, more achievable pieces. So I'm a big fan of breaking projects down into phases as much as you can. Now typically, if you're replacing an old interconnected solution, you're gonna to have to bring the new capability on par with what you've had before. But, uh, but you, I, I generally recommend that you start there with phase one and then add on additional capability after that. Uh, again, you've gotta be committed to that second phase as well too to make sure you're gonna see it through so you can get those real benefits. And then what are the things you want from your implementation partner? Like what are the roles you can fill on the project, what are your expectations of the implementation partner? And we'll talk a little bit about what some of the different roles are and what resources you might wanna to bring to the table. Uh, yeah, and what plan, what do you wanna do yourself? What capacity do you have to fill some of these roles? You're going to have to fill the roles of subject matter expert, business process owner. Do you wanna do more than that? And then how can you align that with your implementation partner? So then uh, next is setting your budget. So uh, budgets for ERP and CRM projects generally tend to range somewhere in the three to 7% of annual revenue for a large scale ERP project. So if you're a $100 million company, you're spending three to $7 million. 
And that number really does change based on the type of business you have and how close your business fits a solution. So if you're a make to stock manufacturer, you're gonna be on the lower end of that spectrum because the solution works pretty well without a great deal of customizations. If you are a configured order, uh, one time I went out to see a prospect who was in the business of screen printing. So they did custom screen printing for their clients. They were about a 20 person company and they did, uh, <clears throat> you know, they did custom artwork, they did, um, you know, various sizes of t-shirts and all these different things. Um, they custom printed it, custom manufactured it, they shipped it. They did all that work. And uh, they were telling me they were kind of disappointed that the last person who had gone in and tried to sell them on that was, uh, the estimate was really high. And I said, I'm sorry to say this, but your business is quite complicated. Uh, and so it is going to be more expensive than a typical a solution just because everything you do is pretty pretty custom. So again, it's going to depend on the type of business you're in and how that fits common ERP type solutions. It's going to dictate where you end up on that that part of the spectrum. And then CRM implementations kind of depend on what's being implemented, right? I mean, there's very distinct components within CRM. There's marketing, there's sales, there's field service project uh, service as well too. So what are you implementing? Uh, who all is involved? Um, so it's, it's really hard to give a, a good idea of what your budget would be as a general rule in a CRM implementation just based on all the different options you have there. And then what are the components that you're going to want to put into your BI or data? Um, and then what also is the impact to your HR system or your line of business apps as it relates to this? Are there changes that you have to make in those solutions to be able to integrate them to your ERP platform, for example? So those are all things that you should think about. Again, if you want to get a better sense of what your budget should be, uh, there are definitely some white papers online about that. Uh, Microsoft did a study uh, years ago to about uh, budget and ROI and, and how to be able to think about that. You can also consider using like a selection consultant as part of your implementation um, selection process, and they will have you know very up-to-date data on what implementations typically cost, or you might even be able to do a short engagement with them to just get a better sense of how to set your budget for the project. Uh, again, your budget should be aligned with the expected benefits of the project, right? If you are going to spend $2 million, you want to make sure that you're getting more than $2 million of benefit from this particular project. So again, make sure that you're not just spending money to spend money. Make sure it's aligned to value that you're going to get from the project overall. So data, uh, the, the thing I would say here is garbage in, garbage out. Right, like any implementation that you do doesn't like magically clean your data. Now it does give you more tools to like detect duplicates and things like that, but it doesn't necessarily fix uh, your data going in. And so we just had a, a quite successful go live here at the beginning of April, but there were still some challenges with their inventory data. So still requiring some cleanup work post go live. If that had been cleaned up ahead of time, would have been even smoother. So take the time to look at your data and make sure that you've got it as clean as possible going into the implementation because uh, otherwise it's just gonna cost you a lot of time or worst case scenario, you're gonna bring your garbage data into your new system. And, uh, and then you're gonna have problems with your new system. And, and unfortunately, I probably see this about one out of every five implementations where we end up bringing over bad data and then we have a problem post go live with cleaning up that data or numbers not matching that you think should match. Again, if, if we would have cleaned that up uh, and the company had cleaned that up ahead of time, we wouldn't be experiencing that. So to do that, you want to make sure that you have owners of those systems. You really want to eradicate all the duplicates you can. You want to build reports to help identify those issues. And then you might need you know, assistance from outside parties to help you clean that data. But you wanna make sure that master data is as clean as possible as you go into an implementation. 
And then you really want to get a better sense of what processes are in scope. So I'm going to talk about this in greater detail in the, in the third webinar around the create phase, but there are these 13 kind of core process groups that we didn't necessarily invent, invent here at Stone Ridge. These are typical things that all businesses do. So every business really has a quote to cash process. Every business has a financial plan to report. Now you might not have some of these other kind of process categories, but uh, this gives you a sense of like what all of this is in scope in terms of the project that you're trying to get done. And make sure that you're very confident about what is and what isn't in scope going into the implementation. So ask your team, make sure that folks know that there might be prioritization um, trade-offs that you have to make. So we're gonna implement financials first and we know that HR is on fire, but you know we, we wanna make sure we get through this implementation before we take that on. So get comfortable, get, with the clarity that you have around what processes are actually gonna get implemented. And then start building your roster for how the implementation is gonna work. So who's your overall executive sponsor? So that should be somebody on the leadership team who can make a call. Um, they don't have to necessarily be in all the meetings, but they should be in the regular status meetings to make sure the, pro the project is still going in the right uh, direction. They should be talking a lot to the team and getting feedback from the team on what's going well, what could be better. And they're gonna be interfacing with the engagement manager or the uh, executive sponsor on the implementation partner side. And then the project owner. So that is the person who is running the day-to-day -day part of the project, making decisions. So it's generally gonna be a more senior person who knows the business well and is empowered to be able to make decisions on what you should do on each step of the process. And then those business process owners. So those are very critical folks to make sure that the business process you know, to be uh, or as is process is understood and the to be process is well defined. So they really need to be engaged in determining what that to be process needs to look like. So they're going to be your business leaders, you know, your controller, your VP of sales. It's going to be those people who own their processes today and uh, they are going to lead their teams into the new way of doing these things. Uh, project manager. So it's advisable to have a project manager on the client side to really just kind of keep things moving from a client direction, uh, for, from a client perspective, because it can be hard as an implementer to try to hold somebody accountable in an organization that you're not part of. So the implementation project manager should be doing really the planning of what's gonna happen next and the strategy around timelines and things like that. And the project manager that sits on the client side is really doing kind of the blocking and tackling of getting people into meetings, getting things moving, checking in on progress and those types of things. It really does help the implementation. A core team lead is someone who's part of the business process owner team. Um, as well, who has a specific leadership over a particular work uh, workload. Subject matter experts, those are people who really know that process well. Um, your IT resources, so you're gonna need some IT operations and IT security folks. You're also gonna need IT apps folks, like um, developers are not really necessary, but if you want to save some cost on the implementation and set yourself up for future, it's a good way to plug them in. BI resources, business analysts who may be sitting in IT or they may be your subject matter experts sitting in the business are very valuable. And then there's a lot of testing that needs to be done. So whether you enroll a subject matter expert as your quality assurance person or if you have a dedicated quality assurance team, that really helps you get more comfortable with the work that's getting done on the project because you know it's been tested. And then just quickly, here's like a, a view of how much time commitment is needed by the role. So again, everything varies depending on the type of project you're doing, the size of the organization that you're in, but this gives you a rough guideline of how much time is gonna be needed by, by each of the roles that are there. All right, now let's talk about buying the software. So first thing you wanna do is define your evaluation criteria. 
And I've written a white paper, and, and now it's in the book too, on as chapter three that talks about the four keys to uh, to to choosing the right implementer for and the right software for your solution. And this really is pretty broadly applicable, or I, I wrote it with the business apps in mind, but after thinking about it and after us going through our own like HRIS selection internally, like these keys are really universally applicable. So anytime you buy software, you should think about these four elements. So what is the fit? How well does it meet your business needs? Again, if you're in, if you're a dental office and you buy you know Business Central for your dental office, you're probably missing out on a lot of capabilities that you probably need in order for that specific function that you're trying to do at a dental office. So you'd be better off from a fit standpoint going with something built specifically for dentists. Um, and then next is the platform. So what is the infrastructure on which this is built? So using my dental example. A lot of that stuff is probably built on uh, you know, old on-premise software. So again, you might be sacrificing in the platform space, you know, Business Central or Finance and Operations or Dynamics 365 Sales or Customer Experience is, uh, is a really great platform that you can easily connect. It's easily supportable. Um, it's got an update path instead of an upgrade path. So those are all the calculations you want to do as you think about, is this the right platform for you? Again, that's going to be a lot of times your IT leader driving that part of the discussion. The next is who's the implementer and how are they going to implement this solution? So are you working with a partner that you feel good about working with and you feel like their methodology is going to help you to lead you to be successful? And then the, the final thing is cost. Is the cost you know, reasonable for what you're getting? Again, um, you know, if you are a 10-person dental office, you're probably not going to be implementing SAP, right? That cost is way out of your uh, way out of your budget for what you're trying to do. But you know, cost certainly is a factor, and if you can get the most bang for your buck on the other three components and it's slightly higher cost, it's probably a good option. Uh, we were involved in a selection uh, years ago where there were six people involved. Uh, five of us said it was going to be about $550,000 to implement. One said it was going to be $175,000 to implement. So I guess guess what the company went with? You know, they went with the $175,000 option. Well, they ended up not being able to successfully implement that solution and uh, you know, they ended up coming back to us and going with us for for a proper implementation. Again, they overweighted the cost benefit and they didn't you know, have their radar go off and say, well, one of these things is not like the other. Maybe we should think about this a little bit more. So again, weigh each of these pretty equally and then determine if you do as you are weighing them, what is gonna be the tiebreaker. And a lot of times, honestly, for companies, it's fit. You know, fit and cost do have a relationship, right? The closer the fit is, the lower the cost is going to be. If you buy a generic solution and you have a significant amount of uh, customizations that you have to do, it's going to drive up the cost of your implementation. And, you know, I believe that if you have a good fit, a good platform, and a good implementer, you know, you should give on cost a little bit. You'll be happier in the long run. All right, now let's talk about what are the steps to go through uh, implement, go through the sales process. So the first step uh, is determining your process. So are you going to do a request for proposal? Are you going to work with a selection consultant? Um, what are the selection criteria? Again, I highly recommend you really focus on those four areas that I uh, just talked about. And then who's your ultimate decision maker? And is that decision maker involved understand the four keys too. We've had cases in the past where um, the committee makes a recommendation, they come to the CEO and say, well, we have three options. One's 350,000, one's 450,000, one's 550,000. We really like the $450,000 one. We think that's the one to go with. And then the CEO is like, well, why not do the $350,000 one? It's cheaper. So if that's gonna be the decision, Makers' 
criteria, then, you know, know that up front or try to influence that and say, well, you know, cost is one component of this. If we get greater efficiency and greater ROI for the $450,000 solution, that is better for your long-term bottom line. And then uh, try to understand if you want it to be internally led and then who is your lead to work with these vendors. Again, as soon as you go out to the process and get a bunch of people interested, there's gonna be lots of calls and a lot of work to do to kind of work, work through that process. And then if you do um, decide to go with an external selection consultant, there's quite a few different vendors out there. You wanna to try to find someone who's in independent if possible. There are um, a number of uh, accounting firms in particular who do both selection consulting and implementation. So they might not be all that independent. And then decide how much you want to spend on these uh, selection consultants. People can spend a you know, significant amount of money on these. So just make sure you're comfortable with the amount of money you're spending on it. All right, now that you've decided on your process, let's go through the steps here. So as we just talked about defining your selection process, the first step is usually qualification. So that might be some high level bullets that you're looking for in a solution. Do you want a cloud solution? That might be a qualifier for you. And if you get a, a submission back from a on-premise vendor, you might say, we're gonna qualify you out on that. Or you might say, I want somebody who's worked in the professional services world before. And if they haven't done that, then I'm gonna qualify you out. So say your qualify, qualification criteria and then uh, at, at a very high level, right? Again, the, the idea here is to whittle this down to typically three vendors that you're gonna wanna go through the sales cycle with. I mean, you can go through with it, go through it, go through the process with as many vendors as you like, it's just your time, right? And uh, again, we've seen several times where we've been one of six and uh, that's a significant time commitment for the, for the team. Uh, discovery, so that is when the uh, the sales team comes in and tries to learn more about your business. So the more open you are with them, the more that you can share about what your business is and how it works and what pain points you have and what challenges you have, the better of a demo and a overall solution you're gonna get. So it may be annoying to have to spend time explaining your business over and over again to all these vendors, but it is a valuable thing to be spending time on. And then you get to see the demos. You get to see how they're, you, how the software would work. Um, hopefully they'll identify a number of the pain points that you brought up and be able to show how the new solution can solve them. And then you wanna talk what the implementation plan is with those vendors. Like how are, what is their approach gonna be? How are they gonna work through it? Who's gonna be involved? Who do they expect you to have involved? And then finally, you'll rate your vendors. So again, I suggest using those four, four criteria, rate your vendors, give your business process owner the biggest weight uh, vote on the fit side, give your IT person the biggest vote on the platform side, for example. And then you start working with your top choice. So generally you wanna keep your top choice and second choice involved during that time so you can work through the contracts with your top choice. And if that breaks down, then you work with your second choice. And then purchasing the software for Dynamics 365, that involves either purchasing it through the implementation partner or working with the implementation partner to, to purchase it through a licensing reseller. Um, so they'll walk you through the process of what you need to do to get there, but um, you'll need to get that purchased to be able to get, get it useful when you're doing your implementation. So then the final thing I want to talk about today is uh, something I added this year uh, around the success by design <clears throat> process. So Microsoft has this fast track uh, approach that they use for implementations that have like 200 or more users. So again, this is more enterprise focused, but <clears throat> a lot of the content that they've put together here can be useful in smaller implementations as well too. So uh, if you're one of those companies that has a large implementation, you can get uh, Microsoft architects <clears throat> involved in your project and they will kind of do these checkpoints throughout the project um, as articulated here. Um, 
<clears throat> so it's they follow this success by design um, process and the uh, process and they do these workshops essentially throughout the implementation so there's a solution blueprint review then they do some implementation oriented workshops uh, <clears throat> they'll do go live readiness and assessment and then a post go live review as well too so I wrote a blog about this recently if you'd like to learn a little bit more about what are each of the steps in the success by design solution I recommend that again even if you're not using Microsoft it's a good idea to do some of these checkpoints as you go throughout the implementation so again something to think about in the initial part of the implementation is like what level of involvement do you want from Microsoft as you go through this implementation? 